Hi, my name is Kimberly Scott, and I am the Undergraduate Academic Advisor for the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. We welcome you to our department information session. I'm joined today by the Director of Undergraduate Studies, Professor Jim Ledger, and our Department Administrator, Kyle Ducart. And then we're also going to have a group of student panelists who join us for the second half. And to start off our information session, we have a video about our department and our two majors, electrical and computer engineering. Sorry, we're going to get this right in just a second. exploration event by the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. My name is Jim Ledger and I'm a faculty member in that department. It's my pleasure today to take you on a little tour of electrical engineering and to show you the ins and outs of our department and our two majors. I'm going to start with a little information about myself just to show you what my career path was like and how I ended up doing uh, what I'm doing at the university. And then I'd like to take a little bit of a deeper dive into electrical engineering and computer engineering and tell you a little bit about what they do. And finally, I'd like to specifically address you and ask what you could do if you joined our department and majored in electrical or computer engineering. So my path towards the uh, career that I chose was to start by majoring in applied physics. I went to California Institute of Technology. I'm from Southern California, so that made sense. You may have heard of this school. It became famous and maybe notorious by being the centerpiece of the Big Bang Theory. That's where all the nerds from the Big Bang Theory did their research. And I can tell you that's a pretty accurate description of what it was like to be at Caltech. Our mascot was the beaver. Uh, we had a football team, but it won almost no games. In the four years that I was there, it won one game and it was against a junior college. On the other hand, it was a very serious and uh, excellent academic place to uh, study. I decided that I really liked uh, applied physics, and so I went immediately to grad school to get a PhD, and I uh, went basically next door to University of California in San Diego. And interestingly, halfway through my PhD program, the department decided to change from an emphasis in applied physics to an emphasis in electrical engineering. So I actually ended up getting a degree in electrical engineering with an emphasis in applied physics. The Tritons were our mascot, and you can see it's much cooler than being a beaver. On the other hand, UCSD didn't have a football team, so we still didn't win any football games. So after I graduated, I think I told you I'm from Southern California, and I was looking around for a job, and uh, 3M offered me a position as a research engineer, and I thought that sounded like a great opportunity. Until I looked at the weather map, you notice that the average temperature in January is 50. That's for a low, not a high, a low of 50. And average temperature in Minnesota apparently is 6 for a low in January. But that didn't deter me. I went to Minnesota. I'd never been there before. Uh, it seemed like an adventure and worked in industry for a couple of years, and that was rewarding, but I decided that I really missed the academic environment. So after a few years, 
I went to MIT Lincoln Laboratories and joined the research staff there in working on lasers and various optical systems. It was a wonderful time. I still had a beaver for a mascot because MIT's mascot is a beaver. You can see he's this friendly guy in the corner. But that was a very rewarding career. It's a, it's a research arm of, the, uh, of MIT that does a lot of national research. I was there for about eight years. And then I discovered that not only did I like research, but I also liked teaching. And so the natural move was to come to a research university. And that's where I've been for the last 30 years. This is a picture of Keller Hall right outside um, our building. And uh, this houses both the electrical and computer engineering department and the computer science and engineering department. It's a beautiful facility. And once again, my mascot is a large rodent. Okay, so now I'd like to tell you a little bit about what electrical engineers do. This is not what electrical engineers do. This is what electricians do. They work on house wiring. Now, I've been trained as an applied physicist, but I've also learned a lot of electrical engineering. I don't think I'd make a very good electrician because I don't know any of the codes or how the uh, wiring in a house should be properly done. I could probably figure it out, but I haven't been trained in that. So let's take a look at what electrical and computer engineers do. Well, the first thing that you notice in that phrase is it's got engineering in it. And I think most of you know what engineers do. They use math and science to solve problems. Electrical engineers in particular work on anything that involves electricity, electronics, and electromagnetism. So. By including electronics and electromagnetism, you've obviously encompassed a very large set of projects that one could work on. And I'll have more to say about exactly what those areas are in a second. The computer engineering part is where engineers work on problems that are at the boundary between hardware and software. And I'll show you again when we explore that topic that it's not just hardware that computer engineers work on, but it's really at that interface between hardware and software. It's probably apparent just from what I've said, this covers a lot of stuff. And I'll, I'll go into that in more detail in a few slides. Maybe one of the easiest and best ways to get a tour of electrical and computer engineering is to take one of the most ubiquitous devices that we all carry around with us, the cell phone, and take it apart. Because in fact, the cell phone has so many elements in it that wouldn't exist without electrical engineers and computer engineers. In fact, it's a real tour de force of the skill that uh, many people have brought to bear on this device that we carry around, something that uh, can communicate around the world, give us instant information, take beautiful pictures, all in something that fits in your pocket. So let's take a closer look. In fact, if we just remove the cover of a cell phone, you can peer inside and see a lot of the placement of these engineering marvels that have been um, designed over the years. But before we do that, um, let's go into the history of how some of these devices were developed and some of the principles that led to their development. And it really, the thing that revolutionized electrical engineering was the development of the transistor. Before the transistor, electrical engineers worked on generating electricity, large motors, some amount of communication, and a radio was around, even a radar was around. But it was really the invention of the transistor by these three gentlemen at Bell Labs, John Bardeen, William Shockley, and Walter Brutan, that revolutionized uh, electronics as we know it. You can see their first transistor on the left uh, was large and didn't look very pretty, but it represented a, an incredible advance in how electronics would proceed afterwards. The second major development was the invention and the development of the integrated circuit. Uh, Jack Kilby and others are given credit for this invention, and in fact, they deserve the credit, but really the thing that's pressed the integrated circuit forward has been a, a steady stream of development in how these th circuits are made. The chemistry, the material science, the optics, 
the uh, understanding of how to lay out the circuitry has progressed over the years. And in fact, Gordon Moore was credited with being one of the first to understand that this was an exponential growth. There aren't too many things in engineering where we can claim there's an exponential growth, something say doubles every two years. Gordon Moore came up with something called Moore's Law, which is plotted on this slide. And this is a, a semi-log plot. It's logarithmic on the y-axis and obviously linear on the x-axis. And so what you're looking at by this straight line is exponential growth. And it's depicting the number of transistors that are on a typical integrated circuit. Intel, one of the first companies to make integrated circuits, in 1971 was able to put a little over 2,000 transistors on their integrated circuit. And now in the seventh generation Intel Core, there are about 3.2 billion transistors on an integrated circuit. So to take another look at Moore's Law in electronics, we can compare the performance of a 1971 Intel processor, basically the first processor available, to the core processor, which is based on a 14 nanometer smallest feature size of today. So the performance uh, difference between those two processors is about a factor of 3,500. They're about 90,000 times more efficient in energy utilization, and they cost about 60,000 times less. Now, if you compare that with automobile technology, we're all familiar with the performance of an automobile. It has been getting better and better with time, largely because, or to no small measure, because of all the electronics that's in a car, running the engine and optimizing performance and so on. But if you just look at the basic performance of the car and put it on the same Moore's law that electronics has been on, cars would be traveling 300,000 miles an hour. They'd be getting over 2 million miles per gallon and they cost about 4 cents. Another way is just to look at the flat out size of electronics. And here we're comparing a magnetic storage device in 1956. It was a type of a magnetic storage, which was like a disc, but it was a drum. And this could handle uh, or store about five megabytes in 1956. And now in the palm of your hand, this is 2016, we have 512 gigabytes in a nice solid state storage device. And in 2020, they're uh, smaller and undoubtedly cheaper. Okay, so let's take apart an iPhone and see what's inside it and see what makes it tick. So here are some of the pieces that are in an iPhone, just disassembled. And let's look at the major component, that biggest board. And what I wanna concentrate on is the fact that there are multiple chips on here. There's the central one inside the IC, and then there are things like uh, battery chargers and their placements for antennas and transmitters and receivers. A lot of things are laid out in this nice, elegant, particular manner. So thinking about computer engineering, this represents sort of the architecture of a computer where your cell phone is a very sophisticated computer and how you lay things out, how much, and how much memory you choose, um, what the different peripherals are, how information is shuttled between one piece of the computer and another. This is called computer architecture, and it's a large part of computer engineering. Now, if you look at that center piece, that integrated circuit at the very center, and blow that up a little bit, magnify it some, this is under a microscope, we see that the design of that integrated circuit is also a part of computer engineering. So there's a lot of computer architecture on the micro scale in figuring out how to place each one of those 3.2 billion gates on a modern integrated circuit microprocessor. This we call VLSI computer-aided design, and it simply means using computers to lay out very complicated integrated circuits. And you would do that to optimize the speed, to optimize the power management and power utilization, and the overall performance of the device. So this is another branch of computer engineering. Now, if we take that 
same integrated circuit and use an electron microscope to look at the details of the features inside that integrated circuit, we now can zoom in on a single gate. And you notice the bar on the lower left shows uh, the size of 20 nanometers. Now, the distance between two atoms is about three angstroms or a third of a nanometer. So you can see that we're really on the atomic scale here. And in fact, it's, it's basically applied physics where we're now designing how to make the different components, the source, the drain, and the gate of a MOSFET in order to have the device consume less power, operate faster, and make it smaller. And of course, this is for a particular element of an integrated circuit, but the people that work in this branch of electrical engineering work on all sorts of nanotechnology and nanofabrication methods, including MEMS, which is microelectromechanical structures. Now, if we zoom out again to look at the layout of your cell phone at the board level, you can see that it not only consists of the central chip, which is the main microprocessor, but there are many other chips performing alternative functions. And in particular, your cell phone has many transmitters and receivers on it. For example, you need a transmitter and receiver for Wi-Fi connections. You need one for Bluetooth connections. You need one for the connecting to the main towers for data transfer across the country. Um, you probably have a GPS on your cell phone. And in fact, many cell phones now have wireless chargers. So the engineers that are in charge of this design would be electronics engineers and how, how one designs low power transmitters and receivers. And RF engineers, those are ones that are like designing the antenna and understanding how to get the information out of the cell phone and into electromagnetic form. Now, there's another area of this board which is completely invisible, and that's the signal processing area. And you can't see it, but there is a lot of sophisticated technology involved in understanding how to condition signals, how to understand the information in a signal on a fundamental level, how to code a signal so that it's immune to noise, and so on. So these are all done by engineers that work primarily on the mathematics of signal processing. I was discussing a little about the antenna design. Here you can see uh, one of the major components. It's an antenna-like structure, but its main function, you probably know, is for wireless power transfer. That's that big part that you can see in the center that looks a little like a rounded square. Uh, the other antennas in this picture are sort of buried in the electronics. Now, if we zoom back out to the standard cell phone, the way it looks to most of us when we use it, we know that there are several interfaces for being able to communicate with it. One is a, uh, a natural language interface. You can talk to cell phones and they understand what you're saying. So if you think about how that works, there are various sensors and transducers on this cell phone that take your sound of your voice or maybe the touch screen so you can understand where your hands are being placed and converts that into information that the cell phone can use. So this is performed by both computer engineers and electrical engineers that design these various sensors and um, also the displays coming up with very bright, colorful, and low power displays. So this is a, uh, another area that both electrical and computer engineers uh, have a large part in the design. Okay, so now you take that same cell phone and you use it and the information that the cell phone has in it has to go somewhere. And so now you're off the cell phone, but you're on some sort of a, an information highway, shall we say. And so there are engineers, primarily computer engineers that work on how these distributed systems are connected around the country and around the world. And in order to do that, you need to use information theory, which is a branch of electrical engineering, network optimization, which is primarily in the computer engineering realm, and communication theory, which is how you code information to accurately 
uh, multiplex it so that you can have billions of conversations all on one communication to, uh, channel and you can separate it out in an efficient way which rejects noise. In order to send this information around the world or even, even not very far uh, terrestrially, it's typically done now using fiber optics. So this is getting into the optical engineering domain, which is more the area that I work in. And without using an optical channel, the internet really wouldn't exist. The um, information that you can put on an optical fiber is millions of times larger in capacity than it would be in uh, an electric form. So we now have optical cables buried around the country for sure and under every ocean and that has enabled us to have communication and send uh, large amounts of data, movies and so on around the planet almost for free. The other thing you need to do is to store the information and so an important part of electrical engineering is devoted to understanding magnetic materials choosing magnetic materials and developing magnetic materials that can store more information in a smaller space and the design of magnetic storage devices. Well, so that was the tour of the cell phone, but that really doesn't cover everything that electrical engineers do. So I want to just mention a few other things outside of the domain of a, of a cell phone. One thing would be uh, design of control systems. Control systems are used for everything from landing a, a rocket, uh, both taking off and, and recovering it, as is recently done by SpaceX. You need some complicated mathematics to be able to control this accurately. Control systems are also used in self-driving cars and robotics. So they involve um, optimization, they involve, it involves feedback, and it's primarily a domain for people that really love mathematics and like to apply it to things. Self-driving cars are a great example of something that's up and coming, that uh, is basically an electrical and computer engineer's playground. It involves not only the control systems I mentioned, but sensing. In a, a self-driving car, there are range finding systems, LIDARs that are on top of the cars, there are microwave radars, uh, there is GPS to download maps, all sorts of things. And they have to be connected in a way that allows the car to take in all this information and control the car. So that's a, it's a real up and coming area for both electrical and computer engineers. Same thing with robotics. Robotics is kind of a fusion between computer science computer engineering, electrical engineering, and mechanical engineering. And electrical and computer engineers have a large role to play in the design of the optical systems for the um, vision of the robot, the design of the uh, sensors that are maybe tactile sensors on the robot arms, uh, control systems, and many other things. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the role of electrical and computer engineering in medical devices. I show in the upper left picture uh, a modern pacemaker. Earl Bakken was a, a student in our department and is credited to making the first pacemaker many, many years ago. He's started Medtronics, which is now the world's main manufacturer for these pacemakers. But this is just one electronic device that's impacting the medical industry. There are countless others. Uh, I show in the lower left uh, the, some of the technology that's involved in robotic surgery and telemedicine. This is a, is a huge one. In the upper right, we see the way that electronics can be implanted in the body for both sensing different conditions of the body as well as, as making some, uh, some changes by uh, introducing a metered amount of uh, medicine and that sort of thing. And I could even connect this back to the cell phone because uh, people are actually coming up with very inexpensive attachments, which uh, allows a doctor to do a remote diagnosis of someone just by having that person ha uh, point their cell phone at some part of their body. So there is a, a real revolution going on, I think, in medicine, uh, which is driven in large part by the electrical and computer engineering advances.
And finally, we'll talk about one of the most fundamental parts of electrical engineering, and that's the creation of power and the distribution of power. This is one of the oldest things in electrical engineering, as you might imagine, but it's also one of the most dynamic right now, primarily because we need to change the way we make electricity. We need to develop things like wind power and solar power, anything that allows us to generate renewable electricity efficiently. And so this is another area that is uh, booming in uh, the area of electrical and computer engineering. So with that, I'm going to leave you with a few final thoughts about why I think electrical and computer engineering is so great. First, both of those majors are extremely broad. There are a lot of options under one roof. Secondly, they're very versatile. They allow you to do all sorts of things. They give you an extremely thorough technical foundation in mathematics and physics and in a lot of practical aspects of engineering. So not only can you work in electrical and computer engineering fields, but there are lots of tangential fields that uh, you can participate in. And finally, and maybe the most important thing, I believe that electrical and computer engineers make one of the largest impacts on our society. They improve the lives of billions of people every day through advances in agriculture, advanced sensing, robotics, medicine, transportation, climate, energy, bioinformatics, and so many other things. So I hope this has given you a little bit of a insight on what these two majors are about, and we hope to see you in our department in the future. Okay, well, thanks for watching the video. Um, so I'm actually live now and i um, happy to be with you. Um, please that you can uh, attend this session tonight. Uh, we have a couple of other things in store for you, uh, including a student panel, which I think you'll be really interested in. But I do want to say one thing that I think you'll also be interested in, and that is that this department is, is quite um, it's quite has quite a history. It's been around for over 130 years. It's one of the first electrical engineering and now electrical and computer engineering departments in the country. And because of that, we've had quite a few uh, famous and successful, not only faculty, but also alumni. And the successful alumni have had such a wonderful experience here. They keep donating lots of money to us. So we have a, a considerable endowment just for our department, electrical and computer engineering. What this means to you is that we give out over $300,000 in scholarships every year. And last year we gave out um, over 80 of them, I think. So it's not too much of a stretch to think that you could get a nice scholarship from this department. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, it never hurts to have a little extra money. And of course, um, getting something like a scholarship on your, on your resume also looks very good for you. So that, that's something because of our, the history of our department we've been able to, to make available to lots of students. So now what I'd like to do is um, introduce another video. This is made by J John Sartori. He's sorry that he couldn't be here to give it to you live, um, but he did make a video of it. And I think you'd be very interested because he's attempting to answer the question that we get asked so often. And that's what is the difference between electrical engineering, computer engineering, and computer science? So with that, uh, let's roll John's video. Hi. My name is John Sertori, and I'm one of the professors in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at the U. One of the most common questions we get from students interested in our program is, what's the difference between electrical engineering, computer engineering, and computer science? Well, these three fields are unbelievably broad and touch pretty much all aspects of our modern world. I'd like to provide an answer to this question in the context of computing systems which is my area of specialization and one area where these three disciplines meet. In our modern world, computing systems are ubiquitous and extremely capable. 
We now have handheld computers with sci-fi like capabilities and they're gaining new skills all the time. Now, when you think about using a computer, what you usually have in mind is some kind of high level application, something that you want to do. You want to listen to music, surf the web or check your email. So there's something that you want to do, but how does your computer actually do these things? The way that your computer actually makes these things happen is physics. Electrons moving around through semiconductors and metals, charging and discharging billions of devices inside your computer. And between the high level description of what you want to do and the low level details of how it actually works, there's a huge gap spanned by many disciplines of electrical engineering, computer engineering, and computer science. So what do electrical and computer engineers and computer scientists do? We design the systems that make the electrons move around in the right ways so that people can use the applications that they care about. Now, we don't want everyone who wants to check their email on their cell phone to have to understand how all the physics work. So we create many layers of abstraction between the top and the bottom of the compute stack and electrical and computer engineers work at every level of this stack, designing hardware and software. Let's take a look at some of the layers of abstraction in the compute stack. At the lowest level, we have electrons moving around. This is primarily where electrical engineers would work, building devices to harness the laws of physics and control the flow of electrons in different ways to achieve different fundamental behaviors. Computer engineers take these low level devices and combine them in unique ways to make circuits and gates that perform simple functions. Then we combine those simple functions into more complex functions and put them together to create an architecture of a computer. Now the programmable computer is a very powerful construct that we pretty much take for granted in our everyday lives. The concept is this, when I load a different set of instructions into the computer's memory, it becomes a different type of computer. For example, if I load Google Chrome into the computer's memory, it becomes a web browser. If I load Spotify into the computer's memory, it becomes a music player. So with a well-defined computer, we can transform it into a computer for any task that we want to do just by loading a different set of instructions into its memory. Now at the highest level of the compute stack, we have the task or application that we want to perform, like checking our email, for example. So to build an email program, a computer scientist would design different algorithms that do things like search the email or sort the email. These algorithms are the building blocks of the application. We code these algorithms in a programming language, which is a type of computer code that a human can write and understand. Then we compile that code into a set of instructions that the computer can understand. So from the bottom of the compute stack, electrical and computer engineers build up to a programmable computer that can perform certain operations or instructions. And from the top of the compute stack, computer scientists and engineers work down to generate a set of instructions to load into the computer's memory to make it do what we want it to do. As an electrical engineer, computer engineer, or computer scientist, you can focus on any one of these levels, or more likely, you're going to focus on many of these interconnected levels that interest you. So electrical and computer engineers take the complex task of performing computations and break it down into levels of abstraction that we can reason about and solve to build more advanced computer systems. Then we put the computer systems that we build into literally everything from cars to appliances, to phones, to robots, and pretty much everything else that gets created today. There's a computer inside adding intelligence, collecting data and controlling our world. So if you want to advance the state of the art and push the boundaries of what is possible in any of these fields, Electrical and computing engineering are the fields that will enable you to do that. Speaking as a computer engineer myself, 
if you want to make an impact on emerging technologies like robotics, self-driving cars, next generation cell phones, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and many more, then I really strongly encourage you to consider computer engineering. Computer engineering gives you a really strong foundation to understand and interface with all the levels of the computing system stack. The skills that you can learn in our computer engineering program at the U of M are always in high demand, and they'll give you the flexibility in your career to do anything you want. Thanks everyone, and I really hope to see you here at the U. All right, hello everyone. Um, I can. I would love to ask the panelists to uh, turn their cameras on, and uh, so we can get going. I'll also start out by saying we have the question and answer uh, uh, function open on Zoom. So start submitting those questions. We're going to multitask this thing, so we're going to answer questions live and on the chat. We're going to test the. Uh, the skills of our panelists to see how well they can answer questions from from all directions. Um, so, but the first thing I'm gonna I'm gonna do is ask our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us why you picked ECE, what your major is, and why you picked uh, your major in this department, and uh, what appealed to you about ECE. Maybe also talk a little bit about your uh, um, current career path, any jobs you got lined up or internships, just, just a quick view. Try to keep it to a minute so we can get to the questions. So I'm gonna start with Anna. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, as Kyle said, my name is Anna. I am a senior studying computer engineering and I'm also pursuing a management minor. And I did some coding in high school, and that's what got me on the path of computer engineering. But I also was really interested in business, so hence the management minor. And I've had two internships with a health insurance company that allowed me to combine the business with the technology side. So I was able to work not doing direct development, but working with the people who were developing and helping apply business concepts to their work and helping them work more efficiently. And that is where I'll be working after I graduate. Research for my honors project under Professor Lana Yorosh, looking at how to develop a communication system for siblings who have a large age gap. All right, thank you, Anna. Um, uh, let's go next to Brandon. Thanks, Kyle. Hi, everyone. I'm Brandon. I am currently a senior in electrical engineering. Uh, I guess the reason why I went into electrical engineering in the first place was because I was really interested in renewables and renewable energy power when I was in high school. And essentially what that led to was me getting an internship in the power industry, um, industry that industry didn't really excite me too much. So I sort of switched my focus towards smaller and smaller circuits. So uh, I had internships in manufacturing and then my last internship was in the semiconductor industry. Um, currently I'm doing research in uh, machine learning. So if you're interested in machine learning, just feel free to ask me a question about that. Um, and then other things, in terms of ECE, I am currently the president of IEEE, which is the largest professional technical network in, I guess, the world. Um, so a lot of EEUs and CompEUs will join that organization. And I'm also a part of HKN, which is the uh, ECE Honor Society. So if you're interested in that as well, ask any questions about that. And then one more thing I should mention is the fact that I'm in the integrated degree program for ECE, which is basically me taking credits as a undergrad to get my grad degree. So if you're interested in getting your master's in five years, then feel free to ask me questions. All right, that was great. There's a lot there. Um, let's go to Cami next. And, and if the panelists wanna start answering those questions in the chat, I'm gonna make this hard on you because we're not here for very long. So we're gonna get a jam packed action here. Go ahead, Cami. Hi, my name is Cami. I'm a senior in electrical engineering. Um, in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just knew that um, I liked math and physics, but then I remembered how much I liked physics too. And I was like, oh, I should 
try somewhere in the ECE. Um, so then I ended up really loving all of the details behind the hardware. I also love, I still love programming too. So I still take, um, you know, random programming classes, even though my internship then too was in the power industry and I'm doing like protection and controls for substations. So that's what I'll be doing when I graduate um, as of now. And then I do want to plug IEEE WE, which is the women in engineering chapter for IEEE. So if you're a, a female and or male, like it's anybody, you know, um, you can feel free to, you know, reach out and we just do fun events. It's just for a group who supports women. So, but yeah, I'll, uh, I'll stop talking now. All right. No, that was great. Okay. And uh, next, let's, oh, I'll mention to all our, our guests too, that you can upvote these questions too. So if you don't want to ask your own, go ahead and upvote some other ones and we'll they'll move to the top. But let's go to Daniel. Hi, my name is Daniel Ajabusi. My pronouns are he, him, his. And uh, I chose ECE because I wanted to be a part of building the future. I remember like when I was in like middle to high school when I got my first phone, how it kind of like baffled me how all the sensors and all the technology that was packed into it. And I knew that uh, from that moment, I knew that I wanted to learn how to build in that because I knew that was the future. Um, I had a handful of intern, I'm currently a senior studying computer engineering. I've had a handful of internships uh, throughout my time here at the university. Some of the most notable ones were I helped uh, with Abilitech, which is a company that makes uh, wheelchairs for paraplegic people. And uh, after graduation, I'm going to be working with IBM on their security team. And honestly, it's been a heck of a ride and I enjoyed every moment of it. And if you, if you pick it, I guarantee you will too. All right, that's that's a fine endorsement, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, now I have to juggle all these questions coming in. In fact, you're answering them already, but I'm gonna look at what looks like a popular question here. Um, and, and it's kind of talking about the concentrations for computer engineering. Um, we had a video on the difference because we know everybody wants to know the difference between CSI and computer engineering, electrical engineering. So we have a video, but it's still a, a, a deep question to look at. So are there any panelists who could tell us a little bit more about the different areas of electrical engineering and specializing and what that means? Perhaps Anna, because I know she's a computer engineering major or anyone else want to venture to answer that for us? Oh, we need a volunteer. <laughs> All right, I was typing, but uh, yeah. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> well, it's it's more about understanding the differences uh, in the computer engineering major specializations. And we can also talk about the electrical engineering specializations. Um, so I think that's a little thing. You can go in a lot of different directions in both of these majors. So may, is there any way you can kind of uh, uh, tell us what those different directions are within the majors? I mean, I would kind of say for electrical at least, um, I would say it's kind of like I I would probably split it up by scale. Um, so you can go really small scale, kind of like what Brandon was saying and working with, you know, transistors or semiconductors, all that kind of stuff, um, which gets really physics-y and um, can get more complicated. You could also work more with analog electronics rather than just digital logic or circuits. Um, and then as you keep increasing the scale, you know, you can get all the way up to power or like distribution. So like um, transmission lines, substation, like stepping up and down power. So I would say um, I would say dip your feet in all areas because I think you kind of have to with your depth and breadth requirements once you get accepted into the major. But uh, there is some crossover um, in some of them. Um, but yeah, I'd say it's kind of broken down by scale. So kind of figure out maybe what what part of that scale interests you the most. I guess. Hey, Candy, quick follow up. Uh, do, you, do you like the math or the physics more? And That's hard because all the physics is still kind of math. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like it's something you just can't run away from. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you feel like it's horrible. But then other times when it like all like gets put together as you kind of take your um, more specialized courses and all the math and physics gets put together, it just makes all the like prior pain worth it. So it's worth it. 
that's my last thing. Okay, I'm gonna open this up and maybe uh, uh, maybe Brandon or Daniel can talk about this because they're connection to IEEE and some of the other stuff, but how does the department, how does ECE support you in your studies? I mean, we're here, you know, the courses aren't easy, right? But uh, how are you able to get through and uh, do well in your courses in ECE? Go ahead, Dan, uh, Brand Brandon, I'll let you go first, and then we'll, we'll see if Daniel's got a good answer for us. Sure. Well, we have faculty guidance meetings um, every semester or every year, and that has been really helpful in, like, helping us decide where to go and helping us plan our futures. And I guess the staff as well, Kimberly and uh, Sarah Dom, have been really influential in helping us uh, succeed in ECE. Um, as far as like getting through classes and everything, I would say the professors and the TAs have always been super influential in helping us pass the classes with good grades. Um, I know I know a lot of students might ignore going to their professor's office hours, but they're super helpful um, just because they can help you go through the homework or go through like questions you missed on exams. And I think that for me has been my favorite part of like how I've gotten through ECE. Okay, that sounds great. Daniel, can you add a little bit to that? Yeah, touching on some things that uh, Brandon didn't mention, uh, they ECE supports us by creating spaces where we're able to work collaboratively. Like the buildings where we're able to work, there's, uh, there's a room like specifically for IEEE and there are whiteboards basically all over the place. So you can collab with your classmates on homework problems literally anywhere in the building. And I think that's where I do some of my best learning where like where I'm able to express the concepts that we're trying to learn with my fellow peers. I'm going to put a little link in the chat there for people, take you to the learning center and you can kind of see the support that's offered for uh, HK tutoring uh, that we do there, all the TA uh, tutoring and all the stuff that happens in those spaces. So that is uh, certainly something that we we spend a lot of put a lot of effort into to make sure that there's support in all places. Uh, there was a question that was popular. I think this is perfect for Anna, and I think she might be answering it already. But let's just go live with this. Um, uh, how much computer science is there in computer engineering? Yeah, I can definitely take that question. So I would say freshman year and sophomore year. I think if I remember correctly, it's about one computer science class a semester and then junior year kind of bumps up to two and then now senior year around three classes a semester and so I would say it's a little more EE heavy sophomore year and then kind of maybe the first half of junior year and so I think so it's definitely computer science throughout but I would say I didn't feel like I was getting a lot of computer science until the second semester of junior year and then going into senior year. So it's kind of a little delayed if mm -hmm. you're looking to get really into computer science, but it's there. Yeah, the requirements at the beginning are there's a few, couple programming courses and a discrete mathematics course that are all CSI courses. And then there's a lot of electives you can choose from from CS as you go on later. And the history of the major it was really a joint effort between electrical engineering and computer science to create a major. So it's, it's sort of a 50, 50 split. So um, in many ways, if you really are into computing systems, it's, it's the best of all worlds. And I know we had some questions in there about, um, uh, uh, about choosing between the two. So that's definitely something to, to explore. You really get deeper into the computing system than computer engineering. Um, so let's see, we got a question about, um, uh, research opportunities that hasn't been answered. Has anybody done research here by chance? I can't remember. Uh, Dan, oh, well, okay, everybody's done it almost. So, so Daniel, why don't you go take that one? <laughs> yeah, so my research opportunity was kind of unique. I did a Europe, which stands for an undergraduate research program. It's a program the university uh, the university offers where you essentially find a professor who's doing research in an area that you're interested in and you work with them to complete a research project throughout the semester. And at the end, you're able to present at the symposium that they have. And it was really insightful. And I learned a lot more than I would say I learned in some classes, just because I got to go through the trial and errors of like developing the entire process alongside that professor. 
And I think it was extremely beneficial. All right, that's great. Does somebody else have another experience they want to share quick? We had a few questions uh, on research. Sure. So I last semester got an NSF REU. So that's called a, that's basically the National Science Foundation's like scholarship for research experiences for undergraduates. And that is something that I got through contacting one of my professors. And eventually he had an opening for a research assistantship for an undergrad. And essentially I just took that and I did research for a semester and now I'm finishing my research with him as my senior thesis project. All right. That sounds good. Thank you, Brandon. Um, let's see, where are we going to go next? We got a question about, uh, I got two directions we could go. Let's talk quickly about the minors and uh, connecting that. I think there's a question about maybe, um, I think there, a lot of people think you might be able to minor in some of the engineering. So you can't minor in really any of the engineering majors. They're, uh, it's not really provided. But what you can do is you can add minors to uh, majors. And I will say that ECE goes through a lot of effort to make sure that we are, are very open to allowing you to explore minors or other directions. Now, I know Anna mentioned she's a management minor, and that fits in really well with both majors, uh, allowing you to count some of those uh, courses required as, a, as electives in our, in our requirements. Um, and we, um, so some of the popular ones are management, uh, product design, uh, math and physics minors are very doable, astrophysics and some of those. So Anna, you had the management minor. Um, how, how easy was it to kind of add to your schedule and, and why'd you choose it? Although you already kind of told us why you chose it, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I chose it because I had an interest in business in addition to engineering. Yeah. And it's been it's been really good to balance out the engineering classes with more kind of fun or business classes. And I think, yeah, for me, it worked well. Um, I, I had a couple, I have to take, I guess, 18 to 20 credit semesters, but that's also because I didn't come in with any credits. And so, which I didn't realize, but even if you don't come in with any credits, you can still fit in a minor, which is awesome. And then obviously if you come in with credits, you're just, it's going to be a lot lighter and more manageable of a load, but it's possible either way. So I think it's been a great to have something else to balance out all the STEM classes. Okay. That sounds great. Um, anybody, uh, Cammie, let's, let's talk about your favorite course in ECE. Give us a, or one that helped you decide or, or really cemented your interest in it. Yeah, that's kind of a hard one. Um, I don't know if I have like a favorite. I think my favorite course kind of like um, that really made like assured me that I was in the right department and major was like uh, microcontrollers. I absolutely loved that class and the lab. I thought it was so cool because like you got to, I don't know, wire up everything on the breadboard first and then you had to program the microcontroller. So I thought that was awesome. Um, but yeah, I think for me, why I decided like EE over Compi, it was, it was kind of a hard decision because I still loved programming and all that, but I really wanted that low level understanding of how everything worked, um, down to like the electrons, you know, I wanted to have that base knowledge and I just thought, you know, I would be missing out if I didn't do that. So that's kind of what the physics and the stuff behind that drove me to pick EE, but you can still take lots of um, programming classes. Like I'm doing a, I guess I'm doing a Verilog lab right now, which is like hardware design language. So even if you pick EE, there's still, there's still options out there. So. Yeah. There's always the overlap between, between the two majors. Uh, the distinction is, is, is not that, is not that much really. Um, and so uh, does anyone else want to stare, share a, a course story? Um, of course, they really liked or really cemented their interests. Yeah, I think I really enjoyed EE2301, which is digital logic, just because I'm a very logical person. And so it was really fun to take a class that was basically just solving puzzles that that is computers and the logic that makes up computers at such a low level 
And so I think that was really fun for me to take and definitely made me more confident in my choice to do computer engineering versus computer, just computer science, because I enjoyed the additional kind of logic that, that got thrown in and understanding how the computer worked. Yeah, it's good to hear that. I think that's that, that's a message we want to send to if you're if you're really into computers, you're thinking computer science, but also thinking about computer engineering. Um, what's attractive about uh, our department is you really get to understand how these things work and you can go a lot deeper if you want, but you still get so much programming if you choose to that uh, it's it's pretty easy to get a software engineering job if that's where you decide to go, but you you open up a few more doors. And understand if uh, things a little deeper when you when you get a computer engineering degree, and really deep if you want to go into electrical engineering. And I'll remind people too: if you're a big into math or physics, and you just want to do math or physics, electrical engineering is a great place to be. You could just go and you could just be a physics or math nerd all day long, and then come out with a great, awesome job offer when this is over. And I see Jim's jumping Absolutely. in because he's a big well, physics you're, nerd you're himself. My song here. <laughs> I, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm an applied physicist, and I love it here. There's so many things you can do applying physics and or math in uh, in this degree. So that's something to, uh, to keep in mind for uh, for people out there who really just uh, have a love affair with either uh, math or physics, which I know some of you do, and it's you can really explore it in EE. Um, and uh, let's see, where else should we go? If the panelists have anything they want to answer, um, please feel free to go. I'm searching my brain here. Um, let's see. I guess this is a nice closing kind of question. In terms of your future, maybe you haven't even thought about this, but like, what, where do you see yourself in five years as ECE majors? Like, what do you want to do now that you kind of know a lot about being in, in the, the program? So I'm going to go in reverse order this time. Let's start with Daniel. Tell us what you're going to do uh, in your career, you think. How do you see yourself? Oh, that is a heavy question. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I think it's kind of amazing because of, uh, because of the depth of this program. It teaches, it shows you how much there is that you don't know. So it really inspires you to learn more about all the different facets of i guess computer engineering in my case but like your respective discipline uh so immediately following graduation i have a job lined up with ibm where i'm going to be working on their security team but i think ideally i'd want to transfer to either their artificial intelligence team or their blockchain team mm -hmm. following that because i think that is like the future of technology yeah that sounds cool cammy what about you find my unmute button. Um, yeah, so I am currently going to be working for um, in protection controls for substations next, uh, I guess this summer, starting this next summer. Um, but I think I want to really be an expert on something like gain expertise. So I probably would see myself um, going back to grad school at some point. But the reason why I didn't go right away was because um, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to specialize in. So I thought getting some industry experience and seeing what it's really like would kind of help me pinpoint what I want to kind of focus on. Um, so yeah, I see myself probably going back to school and probably just diving deeper in all the ways to kind of um, expand and maybe improve the power industry. So we'll see. All right, Brandon. Sure. So. I'm hoping to go into the semiconductor industry. So that's basically just uh, me designing small ICs for various applications. Um, yeah, and that's basically just like the low level transistor design, um, stuff like that. All right, cool. Anna? Yeah, so next summer, I'm going to be starting my full-time job with Cigna, which is a health insurance company. And then I think the direction I see myself going down in a couple of years is project management. So getting to work with the developers, since I'll understand what they're doing, and then also being able to talk to the business and the stakeholders. And so kind of being a bridge between the business people and the developers. And that is something I think that excites me, being able to combine both areas. All right, that's cool. Now, remember, electrical computer engineers, they work in all industries all over. You see a Cigna, a healthcare company, uh, Target hires a lot of our, uh, students in, in this field. I mean, you, you work everywhere. 
And that's what's interesting. And I'm just going to end by saying thank you to everyone. Uh, we're at our time. One last link that you want to uh, notice is in the chat, the ECE matrix. Don't forget about the ECE matrix. If you have any questions and need any help, go there and you will see lots of people you can contact for help, including Kimberly Scott, our undergraduate advisor. And I think Jim Ledger wants to, to take us out here. Go ahead. <laughs> I thought you were taking us home, Kyle. Well, you had your camera on, so I did. I thought maybe I, I that just, indicated I, you wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to add my thanks as well. And, yeah. and um, you know, Kimberly is probably the greatest person to talk to in terms of the nuts and bolts. But if anybody wants to talk to me about you know, a big picture idea of what you can do with a career in either one of these areas, I can either, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions via email or a Zoom um, or direct you to the, the, the appropriate faculty that can. So let me add my thanks uh, to Kyle's and Kimberly's and all the panelists for, um, for attending our session. We really appreciate it. Bye everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>